It's July 1st. I'm John Lorden. Welcome back to Crime After Crime. And with me, as always, is Danielle Hallen. Hey, we're doing it. Uh, Danielle, any big plans for the 4th? No, I'm usually always at the beach. I'm pretty sure everyone watching this has been waiting for me to mention the beach this summer. I always That's do. Right. I'm That's not right. going to be there. <gasps> what? I don't know. I don't know. It's been a weird summer for me. I've got so much going on. So mm. I'll probably just, you know, grill something on my Traeger. <laughs> That's as exciting as it's going to get. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll try to have some more excitement for you. I'm heading to Wisconsin where they have real fireworks out there. Ooh. Things are going to get crazy. Things are. We can use yeah. like sparklers here. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, when we go to the beach, we're like right on the edge of North Carolina and South Carolina. And South Carolina allows big fireworks. North Carolina does not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My grandmother is a rule breaker. She did it one time. She was probably like 70 and it landed on the neighbor's house's roof. Whoa. I've never seen that woman run so fast. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know. But so we and don't what happened? Well, well, we called for help. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing ended up happening. I think it kind of like landed and sizzled out, but okay, okay, it was a scary moment. I, it made me understand why they don't allow fireworks in North Carolina, but I'll stick to the sparklers. Those are fun. There's this place that uh, we go out to in Wisconsin, and on the drive we see this store, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to stop there. It's called Three Fingers Fireworks. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> this doesn't surprise me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Danielle, I'm just, um, are you feeling okay? Yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling fine. You feeling fine? Yes. Are you sure you, you're kind of looking a little yellow? Oh kinda? my gosh. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I think um, anyone that saw the thumbnail for today's video probably knows what I'm talking about. Let's oh, take a no. look at it here. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> I was wondering why we had no like planned thumbnail going because oh. you already had this taken care of. The thumbnail's already done. Danielle, <laughs> for the radio audience, please explain what's happened. I've turned into a thief. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure I stole a trophy. And you're a superhero. Uh, actually, we're both superheroes, we're both, Danielle. Oh, Here's the whole thing. There you go. Oh, there you perfect. Go. Oh, that makes it even better. Yes, uh, we had some <laughs> friends reach out from a company called Turned Yellow. So uh, what they do is they'll take pictures of you and they'll turn you into kind of Simpsons type characters. Yeah. And uh, I said, you know what? We've got this episode coming up about superheroes. Maybe we should have <laughs> a Super John and a Super Danielle. And they said, no problem. Here you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. For a minute, I thought I was a thief. And I was like, okay, I took the bullet on this thumbnail, but not anymore. <laughs> no, no. Although that is that is worth, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, it does look like you're a thief in the thumbnail. It it's does. great. <laughs> I know John's like, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, I like it even more now. I uh, just want to give a big thank you to our friends at Turned Yellow. And yeah, you that's can get, awesome. Yeah, you can get 15% off with them if you use code crime after crime 15 and we'll have a link in the description box below. On top of the awesome digital version they sent us, Danielle, uh, they want to send us a physical copy of it. Oh, and that's awesome. They have some different things like you can get a poster or you can get it on a mug or whatever. So you and I will chat, but you just let me know and, and they're going to send us a product with this amazing image on it. So I know every morning where I need to be like, look, I got this. I'm a superhero. <laughs> I can get through this day. <laughs> exactly. I'll just pull this picture out and remind myself who I am. Yeah. I wonder how, how the kids are going to respond to it, too. I think they'll like it. Oh, they'll love it. All right, Danielle. Time for voting results for the last episode. Unluckiest criminal. Danielle told the story of some unlucky home robbers that chose the wrong house and wound up facing off with a WWE superstar. I told the story of one of the most brilliant safe crackers of his time, Billy Lewis, being taken down by a bag of evidence floating down the river. How did it play out, Danielle? All right, so on the website poll, I earned 50.2% of the votes and John was at 49.8. That's a close one. Woo! That's a I race. Mean, that's real close. Yeah. But I kind of figured it would go that way because I loved both of our stories and they were so kind of different and unique. Yeah. And yeah. then on Twitter, I earned 57% of the votes and John earned 43. 
You edged it out on Twitter for sure. I mean, you, just barely. <laughs> you earn the cup. And here it is, the Crime After Crime mug going back over to oh, Danielle. Thank you. I appreciate it. I have missed it. <laughs> love it. That was a close one. I love that, though. I know. I know. I was really surprised when I saw I had this little inkling when I saw the website poll. I was like, oh, should I go pop a couple votes on there? <laughs> just like, hmm, can I tip this over the edge? <laughs> Today, we are looking at real life superheroes, people wearing masks and capes trying to make this world a better place. The earliest example of an RLSH or real life superhero was found in Mexico City as early as the late 1980s. A man wearing a Mexican wrestling costume called himself Super Barrio Gomez. He didn't exactly fight street crime, but Super Barrio would organize labor rallies, protests, endorse petitions, and even ran in a few presidential elections. But street crime fighters would also come along. According to Wikipedia, a real life superhero is a person who dresses up in a superhero costume or mask in order to perform community service, such as neighborhood watch, or in some cases, vigilantism. Originally viewed as laughable, and despite numerous outcries from police departments warning of impeding on investigations and reminding them that vigilantism is illegal, real-life superheroes are popping up all over the world, and some have become fairly well-known on both social and major media. There are also groups of RLSHs. My brain does not want to say that properly, but they're all banding together, like the Extreme Justice League, the Vortex Knights, Allegiance of Heroes, the Rain City Superhero Movement, foreshadowing, and many others. Mm, foreshadowing. Well, mm -hmm. let's not let's not foreshadow it too far. Let's go ahead and get to it. Let's hear one of those stories right now with our super storyteller, Danielle Hallen. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of all things Marvel and DC. Just to like let you guys know where I stand, though, I'm on the Marvel side. No offense to anyone, but. <laughs> I love the idea in general that superheroes can save the day with their special abilities that they selflessly use for good. But honestly, prior to researching for this podcast, I actually had no idea that there really is a huge amount of self-proclaimed superheroes out in the world today. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Mm -hmm. People that spend their nights fighting for the city as if they were from Gotham to ensure that the people can sleep easier, but they don't share the same superhuman abilities that we see in the movies, just the passion to selflessly fight for good. But another thing I wasn't expecting is that this research took me down another rabbit hole of if these superheroes cross lines, you know, how many times they start with good intentions and quickly things go bad. And it seems like real life superheroes share that same struggle, thinking of the Avengers right now, and walk yeah. the same line between good and evil, throwing their existence into a controversy. So I feel like this episode is going to cause a lot of good conversations. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the heroes that I saw in my research were pushed into action from witnessing crime or being a victim themselves. Benjamin Fodor from Seattle is one of those individuals. Now, Benjamin wasn't always a real-life superhero, but it honestly comes as no surprise that his life took this turn. In December of 2006, Ben began his amateur MMA career. I'm just loving these MMA and WWE wrestlers lately. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but his career totaled 15 wins and only two losses in his first four years. Wow. So he was no stranger to fighting, and he was good at it. So it made it really hard for him to sit by and watch as crime unfolded. But two events just weeks apart really pushed him into taking action. It was 2010, and Benjamin was enjoying the day at a local amusement park called Wild Waves when the unexpected happened on the way back to the car. He was heading to the parking lot with his oldest son when they noticed that the window of their Kia had been smashed out. Mm. Now, they both jumped into action to check the car, see if anything had been stolen, see if the perpetrators were maybe still by... But unfortunately, Ben's son ended up slipping on the broken glass surrounding the car, and he deeply, deeply cut his knee. Mm. It was bad enough that he was profusely bleeding, so Ben was attempting to scream out for help while holding his son, and not a single person stopped to lend a hand. Now, to make matters worse, the intruder had wrapped a rock in a ski mask and thrown it through the window, so that's how they broke it. And further investigations showed that numerous individuals witnessed this happen, and no mm. one did a thing. 
No one even wow. called 911. And I mean, you can't expect everyone to kind of jump in and like fight off a person <laughs> hand in hand combat, but no one even called 911. Yeah, that's so, terrible. Yeah. So while his son was, you know, ended up healing and being just fine, Ben was deeply scarred in an entirely different way. He was disappointed that some awful criminal would break into his car while he was enjoying family time. He was disappointed that, you know, people were okay standing by as someone with a bleeding child screamed for help. But this wouldn't be the last time he would be angry at criminals and bystanders. So just weeks later, he was at a nightclub with friends and one ended up being snatched up and beaten outside of the club. But this time he was not sitting back. He was not gonna watch like everyone did to him. So he actually had kept that ski mask from the break-in in his car. It was still there. So he ended up taking that, putting it on, and running after the attackers. And from this point on, he kind of developed the superhero persona of a man named Phoenix Jones. It's a very, like, movie. I don't know. It's, it, it sounds is. just like a movie. Well, and I, I thought I almost felt like there was a bit coming. Like he took the mask, he put it on, and then he went, "Ow, ow!" There's glass on my face. <laughs> <laughs> ow! Someone help! Yeah, no one but helps. apparently he he cleaned off the mask before mm -hmm. he used it. Okay. Thankfully, or yeah. he just didn't notice the glass, or he failed to, you know, add it to the story. <laughs> right. So for months, Phoenix Jones would attend his nine to five job and take care of his wife and two kids. But by night, he would patrol the streets of Seattle. And also sounding like a movie, he used a comic shop because he was a huge fan of comics to change into costume. So that's kind of like <laughs> his local area. And this comic shop would eventually turn into a superhero meeting place, one mm. of many. But after six months of being no help, he got caught in his own net gun. <laughs> like police literally had to untangle him. <laughs> Um, yes, they laughed at him. He was laughed at police constantly. He actually ended up being stabbed one time. Oh, he kind of figured out he had to go all or nothing. He seemed like very hesitant. He knew he had these skills as a fighter and he was really sick of being laughed at and not actually making a difference. So slowly he began to add in fellow superheroes and the Rain City superhero group came to life. Now, there were nine separate individuals in the group with names like Catastrophe, No Name, I personally like that one, yeah. Thunder 88, D-Day, Buster Doe, Red Dragon, and more. And from what I've seen, a lot of them were actually people that were close to him mm -hmm. that were more so like concerned <laughs> for his safety and wanted to be there with him. Um, but they were each donned in self-made costume. Phoenix had tights on, a mask, and a fedora, which he later jokingly referred to it as his boys to men tuxedo outfit, which I thought was just great. <laughs> See, I knew you'd appreciate that. I thought it was awesome. But they were a group. They had created an ethics code for those that were interested in becoming a part of the group. And Phoenix actually required military or at least martial arts training in their background. He consulted with lawyers to know what he could do within his rights, and he hit the town. They planned to do good like every other superhero to help maintain the safety of their city, and they did this silently for months until their first real coverage on January 2nd, 2011. While rumors had spread about Seattle superheroes, the first huge deed really put them on the map. So Phoenix actually witnessed a man being carjacked and he jumped into action, chasing the car thief, shocking every other bystander as they curiously watched this man in bizarre costume mm -hmm. run at the speed of light after this criminal because he wore his outfit like many others under his clothes so that he was always prepared. Now, interviews with the victim show him explaining this unknown masked man that he referred to as his hero. And of course, CBS got wind of the story and took off with it even making sure to let the owner of the car meet this mysterious superhero while on live TV. And Phoenix was repeatedly thanked and admired for his anonymous heroic work. But the public and police had mixed feelings about Phoenix Jones, especially when they realized that there were eight other individuals walking around in masks and costumes also fighting crime. Right. Yeah. While many were happy that the public was acting, when police sometimes fell short, others were worried that they would cross lines, create more problems, and potentially be seen as criminals themselves due to their masks and costumes. Although Phoenix did say they adopted that as a way to be seen as apart from criminals. I don't know. Yeah. When you're wearing like black tights and a black shirt and fedora and a black mask, I don't know. <laughs> to me, yeah. that screams criminal, but I mean, 
Yeah. And at what point is it a gang? You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And sure enough, just as everyone expected, Phoenix and the others had way too many close calls. They ended up in situations that got them way above their heads. He'd already been stabbed once. There were numerous other issues. They suffered from injuries. They had guns to their heads, you know, threats from the worst kinds of criminals. They were in fact called into police as being criminals themselves and even were mistaken a handful of times by their own targets as being fellow criminals. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. never a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> but because of this, Phoenix eventually stepped up his costume or what he called his uniform to a black and gold ballistic suit complete with faux abs, biceps and all to remain safe. Oh, I'm totally familiar with it. I, I, yeah, I have it. Very it's, popular. Yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially like a mid '90s Batman costume. It yeah, is. That's exactly it's got, what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, it's got the muscles, or like Robin's mm -hmm. costume, and it's, it, but instead of the red that went across his shoulders, it's, like it's yellow. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the yellow yeah. gold. Yeah. But from this point on, the feeling of uncertainty from some continued. But Phoenix Jones' efforts led to over 130 arrests. Woo. So that's a lot. I know it's a yeah. lot, but man, but he was still tiptoeing that line. Yeah. ABC came full force with more video footage shortly after the carjacking that showed another altercation between Phoenix and a potential criminal. So like, here we are, the news is picking up on this, but it's almost like, just like you see in the movies where they're battling back and forth of, is this person good? Are they not? You know, Phoenix Jones was fighting off an intoxicated man that was determined to get into his car and drive off while mm. he was simply trying to protect the driver and possible victims that he could have in his path. Like I feel like most people would hopefully do right. Phoenix threatened the man with a stun baton, something that a ton of people saw as overstepping boundaries. Now authorities did in fact show up to the situation. They were able to handle it, you know, safely get the man away from his car. And while they didn't charge Phoenix with anything and did acknowledge his efforts, they personally expressed their concerns for his safety and other possible criminal charges. But Phoenix said that his use of the baton was exactly what he wanted for his group. He said his initial thoughts when wanting to, you know, protect the public was to become a police officer. Right. But he knew that came with certain restrictions. And he thought acting as a citizen, there was a little bit more leeway and, you know, these certain rules wouldn't hinder his potential. More reports of Phoenix Jones and the other superheroes popped up all throughout Seattle, times where they stumbled upon crime and jumped into action while police sat stagnant and unhelpful. While they were all trained in physical combat, they chose to th use things like pepper spray, um, you know, trying to de-escalate with words or threats if it got to it, but they only did that after calling police in order to protect themselves. They managed to successfully scare off numerous criminals. There was one where they doused a man in pepper spray that was trying to steal an, an actual city bus. <laughs> wow. Which, I mean, with people on it, that could be considered terrorism. I mean, there's so much. And they did successfully get him to run off. However, he was never caught. But this kind of supported the Rain City superheroes because they were able to run him off and police didn't show up for hours despite yeah. numerous calls from them and the public. But still, the tension between police and Phoenix just continued. In October of 2011, Phoenix was arrested for the first time for his efforts, just hours after also being deemed a hero from a victim that called for his aid in the face of a potential beatdown, as he called it. And while authorities said, you know, this was a questionable use of pepper spray, they ultimately let the first incident slide, but kind of used it as ammunition for his arrest that night. So that night, authorities were called to a club in Seattle where Phoenix claimed a fight broke out. So he responded to it using pepper spray to break up the crowd. However, individuals from the group claimed that no fight actually happened. And they mm. even specifically asked authorities to arrest Phoenix Jones for attacking them for absolutely no reason. Now, this was devastating for those that believed in Phoenix and the Rain City superheroes. The idea that they could possibly harm people just for the heck of it and abuse their powers that were already kind of hanging by a thread. This was exactly what the police and the naysayers had been waiting for. Yeah. Authorities deemed the attack uncalled for. They said that Phoenix attacked the club goers as they were dancing, not fighting, um, and they were pretty much drawing the line. But the following day, this was kind of squashed. A video had been taken of the altercation and Phoenix, in fact, had responded to the fight. 
And the individual that claimed the attack was uncalled for and out of nowhere is seen on video repeatedly hitting Phoenix and other individuals with her shoe. <laughs> so he had, in fact, acted heroically. So he was released on bail with no charges ultimately filed. But you can see there's just so many things fighting against him and this whole entire group. Yeah. Criminals obviously aren't going to be thrilled. And if they can lie their way out of it because everyone thinks it's a joke, you yeah. know, it's difficult. From this point on, things were going in a positive direction. In November of that year, Phoenix and the Rain City superheroes managed to capture a man accused of stabbing another individual and actually held him incapacitated until Seattle police were able to arrive and make an arrest. So there were so many good things that happened. But, you know, it's kind of like how many things go. The negative ends up coming in and just taking over. So as the May Day 2012 protests began in Seattle, Phoenix and two other Rain City superheroes went undercover to make sure that the protests remained calm. They were still doing what they set out to do. Then out of nowhere, they all jumped into costume and began to fight back against the protesters, spraying them with an industrial sized can of pepper spray and said they were guarding the courthouse that was being vandalized. Now, while many people were infuriated and claimed that the superheroes unnecessarily pepper sprayed innocent people, Phoenix claimed that he didn't act for no reason. And there were actually a ton of really, really negative articles that were released about him and the Rain City superheroes in this time frame. He explained, however, that he overheard a plot to bomb the courthouse while undercover in the crowd. And he said he was ignored by two separate officers on scene. And so to take matters into his own hands and try to get people to disperse so that no one would get hurt or maybe those people would leave. That's why they jumped in and started to pepper spray. Mm. Now, but again, since Phoenix is seen from the perspective of a hero and a villain, depending on who you ask, and there is absolutely no backing by the police, nobody really knew what to believe. What Phoenix said when he could just be on some weird, gigantic power trip. Yeah. or possible criminals denying their heinous plans to keep themselves safe. Things only worsened when Phoenix got into a full-on brawl with a man after he approached a group of no-good hooligans, something that they weren't supposed to do as superheroes. Phoenix and his clan had watched the men slam their fists into cars. I mean, these men were going all up and down the street. They smashed a window out. They were just creating a lot of chaos. And they did follow all the protocols. They called 911 to alert them, said these people were harassing individuals all along the street, but the police told Rain City superheroes to stand down and move along. And this was the whole reason that they started their group, you know, that to stop, you know, police letting things slip so they didn't listen to a single word. Yeah, yeah. Which like, it's one of those things where you want to root for the heroes, but you're also like, no. <laughs> Yeah, the methods, the methods yeah. can certainly be questioned. Yeah. So Phoenix went to intervene calmly until one of the individuals threatened to follow him home. And he had kids and he had a wife. So in 27 seconds, Phoenix took him down with a few kicks and a quick jab to the face. And yeah. responding officers watched the whole thing. So Phoenix and his group continued to, you know, kind of fight past this negativity and try to do things the right way. They ran a Facebook page where they received requests for help and emergency inside information on ongoing situations. They also had an email address that people could reach out to if they were in a time of need. And when they weren't fighting crime, they were providing acts of service. They were, you know, handing food out to the homeless population. They were volunteering. They did a whole lot to help the community. And they continued to step into the middle of chaos to protect victims, hold criminals until police arrived, and even stepped in numerous times where police were nowhere to be found. But unfortunately, by 2014, as I'm sure many can guess, the group dissolved. Um, Phoenix ended up admitting that they were walking a dangerous line and that he had unfortunately let some of the wrong kinds of people onto his team because it's really hard to identify who is fighting for good and who just wants that kind of power and to right. abuse the power. Uh, and unfortunately, some individuals dark side ended up coming to light, which is really unfortunate. But I feel like you see I feel like you see that with everything. But I think because they were in kind of this gray area, it was really exacerbated. Yeah. So while he had spent the past few years getting a mixture of praise and condemnation, he vowed to still stop crime where he saw it, even if he was acting alone, because those victims that he had saved 
saw him fully as heroes. I mean, he saved lives. He, you know, saved businesses. He saved cars. He saved so many different things um, until 2019 when he decided to retire. Now, he made a statement saying, my whole life has been about making a balance. I've seen a lot of stuff on the street. And in the end, there is not a balance. It doesn't make sense. I've seen what people do to each other. Every day I live with horrible, horrible things. And I think to myself, I made a difference, but I didn't make a difference. None of it made a difference. Mm. He's, I know it's sad. Yeah. His whole spirit's decade. broken. Yeah. Yeah. He said that he genuinely believed that when, or if people saw him acting as a superhero against crime, that they would be inspired by that. That's, you know, a good role model to kind of push yeah. people that people wouldn't just sit as a bystander and ignore bad things that happen in the world. It's not saying everyone needs to jump in and stop every single crime, but like call for help, do what you can in a safe yeah. manner. And he thought it in turn would make things, you know, better and safer. And he thought that criminals seeing this and knowing that there are people out there that are going to stop you, what you're doing, that it would maybe force some of them to straighten up, but that's not, at all what happened. I don't think he expected that much fight back from some of the community and the police department. Despite putting away the costume, he said it was just who he was to stand up for something when he saw something wrong and that was never going to go away. But unfortunately, I think this really did entirely break his spirit because his path afterward landed him with his own serious criminal charges within like a year. Yeah. In 2020, Phoenix was hit in an undercover sting operation. He sold MDMA to an undercover officer. Um, and at a later date, there was another shipment of MDMA along with cocaine in his possession that they found. So he was arrested along with his girlfriend, who was now a sidekick of a very different kind, um, yeah. on January 9th, 2020, for distribution of controlled substances. So, you know, despite a decade of fighting against crime, he somehow fell into it. While many people had been on the fence about Phoenix, those that believed he did good and heard what he said when he spoke to the public about genuinely just wanting to change the way everyone viewed crime and everyone viewed taking care of each other, they were devastated to see that he left a life of fighting crime to turn, you know, in turn involve himself in it, hurting the people of the city that he had once swore to protect. While many articles and victims still praise him for his bravery and his willingness to stand up for anyone and everyone, others still mock his costume and skill, comparing his efforts to a mall cop. While he may have helped a lot of people, local attorneys and police still call him a misguided individual and have strongly discouraged anyone from dressing up in masks and costumes to fight crime. They say, leave it up to the professionals, but I'm very, very interested to see what everyone else's opinions are on this. And before we talk about it, huge thank you to HuffPost.com, Daily Beast, Como News. Yeah. I'm really glad you did this story. Um, Me too. I, I, I knew a little bit about him, mm -hmm. but not this much. Um, some of the things that I see that are kind of problematic in it are you've got an M MMA fighter yeah, with a pretty good record. Mm -hmm. If you've seen photos of this guy, like when he's, he's big, it, <laughs> yeah, when he's in top form, he's yeah. not just big, he's ripped. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he is cut, he's chiseled. This, this guy can do damage with his skills. Mm -hmm. The thing that I'm bothered a little bit by is uh, even in, in MMA, there are certain rules about exactly. being in the ring and what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And now you're taking a skill set that's supposed to be in that kind of somewhat controlled, I know it's pretty loose, but somewhat controlled environment, and you're putting it out on the streets. Yep. And you, you know, you're not going to have a ref that's keeping an eye. You're not going to mm -hmm. watch for making sure that those things don't happen. Um, and the charge for him in terms of getting into an altercation, knowing he's got a skill set that's a lot sharper than any, you know, Joe yeah, Smith, exactly. he's going to bump into out on the street. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it could be a very dangerous ego feed that exactly. he would get caught in very quickly. And it, it, it seems like that's where it went. Exactly. The, there's like a burnout and now a drug mm -hmm. phase. I mean, it, it really well, seems like. Yeah, you, you kind of notice for the most part, I think he had great intentions and he really, yeah. you know, he really did want to change things and protect people and serve the community. But it's like you're saying, it kind of, it feeds into also this part of him that he knows that if it ever came to it and he got frustrated or angry or impatient enough, like that could turn on. 
and there's no telling what could happen. And at that point, that's such an unfair, like illegal <laughs> situation. Yeah. Yeah. And it did. It made me so sad to see that that ended up happening a couple of times. And then it did. It just it burned him out and he ended up taking the wrong path. And there's a lot of different articles about when he was arrested for <laughs> knocking that guy out. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I feel like there's more to it than anyone has really written on because he, I guess, told authorities that this individual was threatening to follow him home and harm him. And he said they didn't care and they wouldn't yeah. help him. And so he felt in order to protect himself, I think he was trying to play it in a self-defense sort of way. But I don't know, because I mean, if you look at most of the incidences, and I only said a few of them, obviously, he led to 130 arrests, like there was a lot of good that he did. And in and most of those times, they did use things like pepper spray and, you know, things that could help de-escalate, just talking to someone. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, also, the negative can really take something down. Like you just do one thing wrong and people will stick with it and it just goes from there. And then what that does after that in terms of the way that you view things and what could e make you snap easier or it's it's one of those things where, you know, the police, they know there's consequences unfortunately sometimes they still go against that but they know but when you have just a civilian walking around with a certain set of skills like directly seeking out crime yeah. it just again falls into this weird gray area and the second you kind of take it too far you've, you've taken it too far well you know there's a saying that uh you know when all you have is a hammer everything starts looking like a nail and mm -hmm. you know him walking around in the yep. middle of the night with that skill set looking for interactions like that you know, yeah, uh, and not to mention, I, I get the idea of wanting a Facebook page and a phone number, mm -hmm. and people could tell you. But now you're listening to information from people that you don't know how valid that information is. Yep. You know, hey, this guy's been threatening me. Uh, maybe it's just someone that I don't like, and I want him to get his butt kicked. And now I'm going to exactly. make Fe Phoenix Jones go do it by telling him, hey, this guy's been harassing me. Yeah. This guy smacked my kid in front of me. Go get him, Phoenix. There's um, just like no no filter no nothing yeah. it's just yeah well and it's it's tricky because a lot of people in this rlsh thing like i don't know if you bumped into any information about master legend but this guy looks like my 65 year old uncle yeah that <laughs> went to the thrift store and put mm -hmm. a costume together and he's walking around the streets and he's basically talking to homeless people that are getting into scraps and kind of you yeah. know, Ma master legend actually they made a tv show off of him and it was like this dark comedy kind of almost showing the ineffectiveness yeah. in a way um it's uh it's different when you're talking about a guy with skills like this like phoenix jones exactly. was close to being legit in terms mm -hmm. of being a, a true street crime fighter it's a shame that there wasn't some type of evolution that happened there exactly like with body cams mm -hmm. re recordings like you know it'd be one thing for him to go into a situation and say hey this guy's threatening me and now i need to do something about it and then when the police show up he's got no way to prove it and the other guy's saying no he attacked me first which is kind of like what happened in the nightclub mm -hmm. um but if he was equipped properly like law enforcement yeah largely is nowadays with body cams uh he'd be able to pop that off and say hey look watch the footage here you can see exactly what happened um, i feel like he just didn't i feel like he thought everyone would just understand his intentions yeah, yeah. and because he understood his intentions which makes me honestly very sad <laughs> yeah um because like I said, I do think he really did want to fight for good. But like you were saying, it's just, I don't know. I feel like there's many different, like a couple handful, at least of groups of people who would probably, you know, turn to something like this and want to be a real life superhero, either people that have zero skill set and are just really fascinated by superheroes. And it's almost like a cosplay type of situation. And then right. I feel like those people are in danger <laughs> like i right. genuinely do and yeah. then there's people like this that have some sort of skill set but they're also in danger of breaking the law and getting themselves into a ton of trouble yeah it's like this weird middle ground but at the same time how many people are out there that just don't label themselves real life superheroes yeah. you know but they're also yeah. out there fighting for justice and doing these things i think almost putting that label on it and adding a costume to it it's, I don't know, I went through so many different levels of thoughts. 
right. when I was looking into this because well, and extend this out, Danielle, like, you know, the rest of the process that happens around yeah. this as well. What happens when they're trying to run charges against these people yep. or if there's supposed to be some type of prosecution now, they don't have the information that because it didn't come to them through a proper channel. Exactly. And what is Phoenix Jones going to go take the stand and you know be in costume? In, yeah, exactly. Right. In court Which he did, court by date. the way. Yeah. It, with his yeah. own charges, he did. He showed up in costume and he, well, he ended up having to release his identity afterwards in a press conference because when yeah. he went to trial, he showed up full costume and the judge was like, please take your mask off. Yeah. Like, we have to know that it's you. Yeah. And he did, but he ended up having to, of course, afterwards. But I mean, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's tough because, it's tough. you know, we, we, we also, in superheroes. but we also work in an area mm -hmm. where we have people trying to do the right thing. Exactly. And all of us have different skill sets also. Exactly. So, I, I, this is one of my other levels <laughs> that I yeah. was going through. I mean, you can apply this to so many different situations and it's just interesting to see the different responses based on what you characterize it as. Yeah, definitely. So, man, I could go on forever about this. Now I know why. <laughs> uh, before we were recording, Danielle's like, I can't wait to see the comments off yeah, this video. I'm um, so interested to see what you guys think about it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, excellent story, Danielle. Lots to talk about, lots mm -hmm. to still think about on that. I've got one to share also, and we're going to do that right after this short break. You know who's my superhero in the kitchen? HelloFresh. No stressful meal planning, no desperate internet searches while things are burning on the stove. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to your door with everything you need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. Get that body in superhero shape. With more than 25 recipes featured every week, eating healthier has never been easier. They also have locale, carb smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. I recently had the black bean and poblano flautas with guacamole, pico de gallo that I actually made myself, and sour cream. It was so easy and so amazing. Their detailed instruction sheets help you every step of the way, and they'll keep you from turning into a kitchen supervillain. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers, and you won't be overbuying produce. It's in the perfect amount for the recipes, which helps save the planet. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Try Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021 with over 4 million households served. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh is here to save the day. Try America's number one meal kit right now. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I feel like I'm I'm realizing how much I love superheroes in this episode. Yeah. I am. I feel like it's something super fascinating to think about. And so I'm really excited to see what your story kind of brings into this. I am too. Just a, a little behind the scenes on this. Um, Christy Arnhart, who works with me over at Lord and Arts, uh, let me know about a story that was happening in her area uh, several weeks ago. And when I saw that, I actually pushed for this episode with Danielle. I was like, uh, Danielle, I think we need to do real life super because I wanted to tell this story. And honestly, I wanted to look into it more. I didn't yeah. even know. But uh, so that's where it came from. Are you ready? I'm so ready for this. OK. Now, Danielle, I'm sure you can imagine I have been a fan of superheroes since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And we had this amazing product back then. I don't know if you'll know this. It's called Underoos. What on earth is that? <laughs> I knew it. I knew you wouldn't know. That's good though, because now I get to explain okay. it. All right, perfect. Basically, underoos were a t-shirt with your favorite superhero's logo on it and matching underwear. Oh, my son would love that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you would feel like a superhero. Yeah. And, and back then, like in the 80s, like, yeah, you could find some t-shirts. They would have like a picture of the superhero or mm -hmm. something, but underoos were specifically like their costume. So like, like Superman, like, yeah, you know, like, the buttons and well, not just the logo, just the straight. Like if you mm -hmm. wanted to cosplay underoos were the way to go. Like Wonder Woman, they had, you know, the Wonder Woman top and mm -hmm. then the underwear for it had like the stars, like the blue background. Oh, of the stars. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was like spot on. Um, but despite the feeling of awesomeness that I would get putting on underwear 
that looked like they came straight from Krypton. There was a sad truth. Underoos didn't give you superpowers. No heat vision, no freeze breath, no ability to fly. Heck, my parents weren't billionaires and they were both still alive. I couldn't even take the Batman route. <laughs> There's no option. <laughs> yeah. You know, essentially having my parents buy my way into being a superhero, I couldn't do it. But many people without Bruce Wayne's budget are now costuming up and patrolling the streets. One RLSH has recently stated he's stepping in on a case that police and even the FBI are having trouble solving. Ooh, I'm excited. He is going after a serial killer. That's a big one. Yeah. That's quite something to tackle. Around 2 a.m. on August 24th, 2020, in Little Rock, Arkansas, police responded to a call. They wound up finding 64-year-old Larry McChristian deceased on someone's front lawn. There was severe trauma to his body, and Larry had been called in as a missing person just a few days prior. Unofficial reports say he was stabbed. The suspect left, then came back and stabbed him possibly several more times. A month later, September 23rd, again in the early morning hours, another attack would happen. 62-year-old Jeff Welch was found dead with knife wounds to his neck. In November of 2020, police appealed to the public for help with the Larry McChristian case, saying they just weren't getting enough solid tips. They put out a $10,000 uh, reward, and media was used to raise the awareness of the killing to a new level. It appears that was enough to hold the killer at bay for several months, but in the early morning hours of April 11th, they would strike again. Deborah Walker was stabbed more than 15 times but survived the attack. Oh boy. Less than 24 hours later, 40 year old Marlon Franklin, a homeless man was killed again by stabbing. How have I not heard of any of this? I know, I know. I didn't either until Christy told me. And that's why I was like, I gotta, I gotta yeah. get this out there. So all four victims attacked in the early morning hours between 1 and 4 a.m., all in the Midtown area of Little Rock. Like if you look at a map, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, the, the location, like how close all of this is. Uh, surveillance video, they have surveillance video, and the surviving witness, of course, mm -hmm. uh, gave police some form of a description of the perpetrator. A male standing over six feet tall, possibly black, wearing dark clothing with a hooded sweatshirt. The attacks didn't seem targeted, but random in nature. Just very local. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the FBI agreed to assist in the investigation. Little Rock Police Chief Keith Humphrey noted that his agency stepped up patrols in the area and told the press, quote, let me be clear, we will do everything possible to arrest this suspect and protect our city. This real life terror was given a fitting name, the Little Rock Slasher. Oh, man. The community was getting more and more anxious. Outside of the area of the attacks and the hours that they chose to strike, the attacks made no sense. Sometimes the victims were women, sometimes men. Age didn't seem to be a factor. The story hit national news coverage, and we're all still waiting for a break in the case and for law enforcement to bring a suspect in. But somebody else has offered to help. Quote, I am Shadow Vision, a real-life superhero. I protect the innocent at whatever cost. I would sacrifice my own life to save an innocent life. On September 7th, 2021, the Arkansas Times posted an article written by Austin Bailey titled, Local Superhero Shadow Vision Vows to Take Down the Little Rock Slasher. Below the title, a picture shows Shadow Vision, his black helmet, uh, kind of looks like snake eyes from G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe. He's got shoulder and chest plating with spiked gauntlets that look a lot like Christian Bale wore them in The Dark Knight Returns. In his hands, two katana blades and strapped well, to right each. Then. Yeah, he's not messing around. <laughs> not at all. Strapped to each thigh, a Japanese sigh. So he's like a mashup of Leonardo and Raphael from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Below the picture, a caption reads, a superhero emerges from the shadows. Reportedly, Shadow Vision has been on duty in the North Little Rock area for eight years now, but he states in a Facebook video that people didn't really know he was even there until it seems like early 2020. 
Uh, he states he's been a superhero since the age of 12 and reports he's originally from Scotland, though I can tell you I've listened to 40 minutes of him talking and I didn't pick up any hint mm -hmm. of a Scottish accent. Probably just uh, trying to throw people off his trail. Probably. <laughs> uh, he says that he felt a calling to the area. Quote, I heard everybody here was losing hope, so I decided to head out here and start helping. He says he became a real life superhero because of the dark family history that he has, and he vows to stop evil however he can. When it comes to the Little Rock Slasher, Shadow Vision has posted some very direct words to him on his Facebook page. I know that the serial stabber is keeping an eye on my page here, so this is a threat to you. When I find you, I will show you what I do to serial killers. I'm hunting you right now. Shadow Vision claims that he has stopped a couple of armed robberies and says he's exterminated two serial killers. Oh boy. He says he's a first degree black belt in both ninjutsu and taekwondo. Despite that training, in a Facebook Live from 2020, he stated he was looking for a sidekick or another RLSH to help him on patrols. And according to some of his more recent Facebook video posts, he's accomplished that. Teaming up with Master Legend and Tothian regularly, they go on patrol asking for tips about the slasher. And based on some of the videos I've seen, men mainly breaking up arguments between homeless people while they walk around at night. Mm -hmm. But Shadow Vision stays focused on his current hunt for the slasher. All I can say is he can either turn himself in or I will hunt him. I want him off the streets one way or another he will be. Hunting him might be a slow prospect though. Shadow Vision posted on April 4th, my patrols are pretty limited due to not having a vehicle. He's mm. fundraising. <laughs> yeah, he's fundraising mm. for a Toyota Scion to help with his patrols, which he states is agile and can take turns at high speed. He says the previous Shadow Vision mobile, I guess I'll call it, mm -hmm. uh, he says it got shot up. So he oh, needs boy. a new car. Yeah. Okay. Interesting someone, choice of car. Oh, well, I was just going to say someone. <laughs> yeah. And the articles even point this out that I bump into. Someone might want to let them know that Toyota doesn't make the Scion anymore, but <laughs> they, they haven't since oh, 2014. No. Oh boy. <laughs> but you know, a secondhand Scion, there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. Is he helping on the streets or just helping by make, make making people smile, uh, taking pictures with fans and tickling our funny bone while posting on social media? It's yet to be seen. Several writers are commenting on one of Shadow Vision's super abilities, though. This guy has a lot of heart and is trying yeah. to make the world a better place. Um, yeah, he is, currently has over 10,000 followers on Facebook, which exploded after this coverage of him, by the oh, way. Oh, I can like, imagine. Yeah. Uh, and he has a Teespring store where you can buy merch featuring his logo. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, Danielle, <laughs> let me know if you want a pillow or a shirt. I, I got you hooked up. Uh, he states that he's going to pump 90% of the proceeds back into the community. He also oh, states, awesome. yeah, uh, he also states he's working on starting a nonprofit organization focused on helping Arkansas get their community watch program started. Yeah, which sounds like it's pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> at the yeah. moment. Uh, some are reporting instances of him helping families in need, including giving a Christmas tree to a family that couldn't afford one. And for a while, he was collecting funds for what he called Visions of Hope a program to give less fortunate children uh, to give to them during the holidays. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. I love the name yeah. Visions of Hope. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's one of these things. The community watch angle is interesting to me mm -hmm. because I also feel that there are there's a good amount of people out there that if they saw something happening might not act on it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Might turn their head, might not pay attention. And I think... That's part of this superhero movement that can be appreciated. Exactly. Is we have people that are literally walking the streets at night. They're literally looking for things. And if and nowadays, especially, it's getting better because there's this live streaming aspect that's coming into play. Exactly. Now. Uh, like you can watch Shadow Vision and Tothian walking around. What Tothian, by the way, has psychic abilities, but we won't get into any of that. Okay. All but right. uh, I might have to. But, I might have to look into that on my. Own. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but these guys are actually, you know, they're out there. And they're armed with one of the best things that we've seen in recent history for really making change, 
They've got their cell phone. They've got their cameras. Yep. They're already live streaming. So like half of what I see in my head as some type of way to help these neighborhoods, they're acting with with that already mm -hmm. there. Exactly. Um, because what just, do most people say after a crime? You know, I wish we had footage of this. I wish CCTV picked something up or, absolutely. you know, so if they caught something, that's immediately yeah. like one of the most beneficial things to do. Yeah. Now it's, it's what's strange is in his, you know, Tothian's costume, like you look at that guy and you're like, all right, dude. Um, but Shadow Vision's costume, like he looks like, you know, some type of G.I. Joe paratrooper mm -hmm. ninja that is fallen out of the sky. So I do think it's a little unfortunate that the benefit of someone out there, eyes open, ears open, trying to help the streets with the cameras is wrapped up in you know, I've got two katana blades on my back. I've got Japanese size on my thighs. I've got, you know, spikes on my gauntlets. Yeah. Um, it's there's there's got to be something here kind of in between that makes us all work. Like, honestly, exactly. Shadow Vision's costume is way more intimidating than Phoenix Jones. Like Phoenix Jones is intimidating because he's big and he's muscular, yeah. but and his it. costume <laughs> His costume really emulated, like I mentioned, like Robin from yeah. the, the mid '90s mm -hmm. Batman. Like there's this nothing is, threatening necessarily about it. It would make yeah. you like take a second look, but yeah, you're like, oh wow, he's got some rubber abs. I mean, yeah. it's <laughs> it's nothing like this is you know this guy is like armed out there. Um, but to the point of what I'm seeing, there's a bit of a debate happening in the articles. Yeah. Even if he isn't quite sticking the landing, his heart does seem to be in a good place. Mm -hmm. What does law enforcement think about him? Well, when Shadow Vision was noticed by KATV News in late 2020, North Little Rock Police Spokesman Officer Joseph Green stated that they've received no complaints about him. And, oh, quote, people get a kick out of it, seeing him on the side of the road. He's no harm whatsoever. We all know him now. Okay. Well, that makes me feel happy. Well, and, you know, Phoenix had that for a period of time, too. Like, yeah, you can until find pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like if you run a search on Phoenix Jones, you'll see pictures of him with mm -hmm. cops like they're hanging out with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they uh, helped him in like that first few months. Like they would come across him after he'd call into a crime like they had to get him out of his own net. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and they were I think they were encouraging him. And, you know, I remember in one interview with him, he was saying that the first person like he took down and held until authorities got there. Um you know, he was stabbed first and authorities were like, wow, you like managed to get stabbed and keep this guy for us. Like, that's awesome. Right. And they were really rooting for him until it started like tiptoeing yeah. the, the weird way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I even just as a little diversion or a little sidetrack here, I just read a story about Phoenix where uh, there was this guy. I, th I think he's a blog writer or maybe mm -hmm. a, 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 a journalist. Oh, it's probably the guy uh, that really doesn't like him. Well, no, no, no. This guy was hanging out with him. Oh, like he actually went on a beat okay. with him. Oh. And he said that uh, they came a upon some crack dealers and the crack dealers were like, what are you guys doing here? Get out of here. Yeah. And uh, Phoenix was just like, no, 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 we're not going anywhere. And the crack dealers were like, well, we're going to have to show you how our burners work then. Oh, and my the, gosh. The author is like burners. I thought that that was a type of phone. And Phoenix tells him, he's like, no, they're talking about their guns. Yeah. And goes walking up to him. And the, the dealers are now approaching these guys. And Phoenix is like, no, we're, we're not going anywhere. And the crack dealer gets right in his face. He's like, is this how it's going to go down? Is this what we're going to do? And Phoenix is like, yeah, I guess so. And the crack dealers go, whatever, man whatever and they left yeah he turned around he broke it up they just walked away <laughs> and i know and i i think that was like i think acting like a superhero and like you have no fear like i think that yeah. definitely did benefit him yeah. to an extent most people be like mm, this is like this is okay thank you but no thank you this is the part where i leave now the writer that was with him said, I went right back to my hotel room and my knees came out from under mm -hmm. me. Like I just buckled. Yeah, I would have passed out right then and there. Like, okay, great. You have this bravery. I do not. Right. <laughs> Hi, I know I'm with him, but consider me just like, <laughs> I'm not a part of this. <laughs> I know. Uh, um, back to the police statement about Shadow Vision. Uh, when asked if the police at least know who he is, because mm -hmm. he's wearing this big mask, you have no idea. Officer Green says he actually doesn't. He doesn't oh, wow. know his, his true identity. Okay. Now, Shadow Vision does have his critics. A man named Butthole Surfer commented. 
So a very, a very, you know. <laughs> I think that's famous, right? I've heard, I've heard of Butthole Surfer before. <laughs> um, he commented on one of the articles about him, quote, he has claimed in the past that his mother was killed by a serial killer when she was actually still alive. He very recently claimed that his house burned down when we know for a fact that it has not. He didn't move here from Scotland eight years ago. He lived in North Carolina. Oh, great. Guess what, guys? I am actually <laughs> just kidding. I knew it. I knew it. I am shot a bitch. <laughs> uh, oh, and he's never been documented as stopping any crimes. And now he wants you to buy him a car. He's a fraud who's attempting to get fame and money from pretending to fight crime. Uh, I think he's actually removed the posts about the car since any backlash around this. And honestly, I can tell when people come at him on social media mm -hmm. and stuff, he just- He gets he upset. No, he has no, he, it's like he has no sense of what they're complaining about. And he okay. just kind of goes back to, I'm just trying to be helpful. I'm just doing what I can to try to help yeah. people. Um, it just, it really, it's really clear he's coming from a really sweet space in his heart. It's just, you know, the, the look is a bit much, but. Um, yeah, and it's kind of difficult too. I mean, if you're claiming things that aren't true, like maybe he's justifying that as trying to protect himself and his identity, you know, just kind yeah. of like throw people yeah. off track. Well, and like I said, you know, I mean, some of these guys, like like I mentioned, Tothian, you know, Tothian has psychic abilities. <laughs> <Poor Tothian. laughs> like, some of them, like they're claiming to have superhero backstories that include some type of extra powers and stuff like yeah. that. I, I think there's some aspect of this when you get into that cosplaying situation. Exactly. That you start developing a character and parts of the story of that character, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're now being reported. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're being reported to people now. But I think an editorial piece at Arkansas Times put it best. Uh, a writer there who apparently has a secret identity himself, he's called The Observer, wrote, what does it matter if a person dresses up in a costume if they only want to be of use to others, mm -hmm. if they only want to help? It's the want to help that's the important part. It's also what could lift us out of so many of the self-made messes our society has found itself in if we only had more of it. Now ask yourself, what the hell have I done to help today? Of course. I love that. Yeah. I'm yeah. over here like, woo, go Topian. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was the observer, actually. <laughs> I, I know. I'm just, I'm laughing. Topian. Yeah. Topian already knew about that two days ago. <laughs> Uh, of course, we cannot forget that this story includes very real tragedies in it. There's a community still looking for justice. Uh, I've been looking. There's no new articles about the Little Rock Slasher since Shadow Vision story broke out. And Shadow Vision story is what really kicked this to international level. Yeah. Um, but anyone with information about the Little Rock Slasher is asked to contact police on their anonymous tip line at 501-371-4636. They've now increased the reward. It's up to $20,000. And I'd personally like to see law enforcement handle this one so shadow vision can focus on what he's doing best helping yeah. the community giving us a smile or even being a target for online trolls however you you see fit mm -hmm. but uh once again a big thank you to christy arnhart katv arkansas times daily mail cbr nerdbot independent.co.uk and wikipedia for information contributing to today's story Oh man, see that one also takes me down those many different rabbit holes and levels of, you know, it, it, it just like that article said, the observer, you know, it's the wanting to help, you know, yeah. and do good that matters. It's yeah. like, so what someone puts on a costume for that? Like it, and for that us, be so what that we sit in front of a camera to do that instead of, you know, like everyone has their own version of that. And as long as you're not just like directly absolutely harming and you are trying your best to help and doing it in a proper way what does it matter yeah and everyone's version of that exactly is going it's going to be imperfect to mm -hmm. start with and it might be imperfect for a long time and it might take constant development yeah. and nurturing that's why part of the phoenix jones story kind of breaks my heart because it's yeah, like exactly this guy is he's looking for something he's dancing around it i feel like he didn't quite find and then it he just lost it entirely exactly and I, I think with shadow vision we kind of have a similar situation where um there is a way for him to be helpful i mean i saw pictures people love taking pictures with this guy out on the street you know they they're treating it like cosplay yeah and you know he's walking around the neighborhoods and they're like hey look there's that superhero guy it's it's a nice 
thing. Exactly. Um, I just, I just personally wish that the, you know, the katanas are just. That's a really serious weapon. Yeah. Uh, the size are actually not. Those are. Um, it's weird because when I was a kid, I always thought that those were like little swords, but they're not. They actually, they're blunt objects on mm -hmm. the tips. They're, but okay. uh, the katana is a different thing. But I just had to say my favorite picture of him in full costume. It looks like he took it in his house. He's like standing in front of a wall. He's got his full costume on. It looks all awesome. And right next to his foot on the ground is a cat food dish. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just, you know, shows we're all human no matter what. Yeah, I just love it. Uh, I also found out that uh, since you didn't know what underoos were, Danielle, they actually yeah. had a comeback oh, in 2020. Liam is going to be thrilled if they still exist. Well, but the thing is, from what I've seen, um, I think they were playing to the age of their audience because now they're in adult sizes. But <laughs> you, you can find some stock available. You can get some again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to say that. Yeah, if you see me running around in the Twin Cities in a Batman t-shirt and matching underwear. Don't ask might, any questions. Yeah, that might be John Lorden. <laughs> and uh, I might be in training to become Shadow Vision's new sidekick. Oh, man. Yeah. I'd support it. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if you are interested in underoos, check out Amazon.com. They still have some there. But <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Liam would have loved that. Man, I feel like this is going to bring up so many good conversations. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting how you kind of see a topic for exactly what it is, but then you start reading into it and researching into it and see kind of like the parallels and so many other things. And then you just get going on it. And it, I don't know, I think it's important to talk about. And it's, first of all, I'm already shocked that there are even like real life superheroes out there. Yeah. <laughs> I quite yeah. literally had no clue what to expect going into it. And I, I was telling John, I kind of wanted to go an entirely different way with my research and then stumbled into all of this, you know, real life superheroes and how many there are and that there's all these different groups and how different all the different groups are. And it was very interesting to see. I did not know this was a thing. As far as I know, where I live has no superheroes. <laughs> Maybe they need keep, one. Keep your secret <laughs> identity, Danielle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Keep your secret identity. I know what you're trying to do. <laughs> oh, and I know, uh, you know, Danielle originally wanted to try to find like a, a superhuman ability in some yeah. way. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, that's what the extra stories are for. I might have your back on that. Ooh. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we should get started. Okay. So my first one brings me very, just so much joy. <laughs> so since 2015, the streets of Plymouth have been guarded by an unknown man that goes by the name of Basilisk. To all you Harry Potter fans out there, you know why this brought me so much joy. <laughs> Um, but Basilisk was, it's actually a very touching story in my opinion. He was diagnosed with Asperger's as a child and was bullied so badly through school that he decided to kind of take up wrestling as a way to defend himself. And it was kind of like his place where he thought he'd find his people and all of that. But unfortunately, his wrestling team also turned against him. So in the middle of high school, he ended up having to leave school and be tutored from home but he vowed to always stand up against violence from that point on. He wanted to protect people just like himself, so he ended up going on to earn his uh, bachelor's in criminal justice, which I thought was really awesome. But with the drive to work on his own, you know, he wanted to have his own terms, kind of be alone probably because of all the past trauma, he decided instead to create a disguise and a superhero name, Basilisk. So Basilisk, as far as I know, to this day, can still be seen patrolling the streets, corners, and alleys. He de-escalates crime. He also works hand-in-hand -hand with police. Mm. They have no issues with him either. He said, and I quote, I'm a crime fighter. I'm not in it for the glory. He's even been featured in a book called Heroes in the Night, and he regularly speaks up against bullying and how it's still not dealt with the way that it should be. That's, That's quite, awesome. I love the story. I thought it was so sweet. And he, he makes sure he kind of goes with the law and doesn't take things too crazy. He says he deescalates. He doesn't come in and, you know, pepper spray people or yeah anything yeah. like that. So I loved it. I thought it was so sweet. And it's kind of like how I mentioned in my story that almost every single one of these people, you know, they either were a victim or witnessed yeah. someone they care about being a victim. And so they were really pushed to do something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you could be against uh, people that want to serve the community in that mm -hmm. way. It's yep. it's really just are are the methods working? Are they yeah. using good tools in that? But uh, speaking of good tools, in 2013, two men walked into the Bradford Central Police Station in England. 
but one of the two men was Batman, mm. the 1960s Adam West version. And he was bringing in a real wanted criminal. Quote, I've caught this one for you, he said to police. He then told them, I deserve a medal. I'm a caped crusader. The CCTV footage of him hit the internet and became a viral sensation. So people demanded to know more. Did Batman swing down and capture the thief, use a batarang, and then drive to the station in a Batmobile? But Danielle, you know the details aren't always what you expect. Batman was actually a Chinese takeout driver named Stan Warby, and he told the media, quote, Danny's a good friend of mine, and I've known him for 15 years or so. I had spoken to Danny during the week and tried to knock some sense into him. It was getting on my nerves, having police round all the time, asking for him or his whereabouts. It was a joke at the end of the day, and Danny wanted to go to the police station. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so his friend was a real wanted criminal. He was tired of it. And Danny at some point said, okay, like, I need a ride. <laughs> yeah, I need a ride to the police station. He said, okay, but let me put my costume on real quick. <laughs> Oh, I absolutely love that one. And you know that's something they can look back on. Just like, Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, remember that time? Yeah. Remember when you dressed up like Batman and it went viral? Oh, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew, Danielle, that Batman was such a joker? Oh, my gosh. You're ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now, this next one comes. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I just needed really good feel good stories after I did my case and this oh, one yeah. is like such a good feel good one these aren't exactly superhuman powers but i thought the story was sweet and as a parent this is my kind of superhero moment like i about cried reading it but in august of 2019 actor danny trejo or the actor better known as machete watched as a car overturned in his california neighborhood now the vehicle was upside down one of the two and there was a child strapped in a car seat in the back and also a grandmother and they were both trapped in the car he ended up working with another woman who witnessed the crash to get the little boy out of the back seat but firefighters had come and they were trying to get the grandmother out and they weren't having much success at first so trejo decided to distract the little boy by convincing him that he had superpowers you know, to keep his mind off of his grandmother and what had just happened. He was naming all the moves and being like, oh, show me your muscles. Let me see your muscles. Wow. Mm. You know, talking to him about how strong he was. And it was enough to keep the little boy calm until his grandmother was safely out of the vehicle. Wow. I thought it was so sweet. That is awesome. <laughs> I loved it. I think that's a superpower. It is. I'm telling yeah. you what, to keep a kid calm. I'm a mom. I know these things. It's super. It's a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know, Danielle, you were looking for a story of true superhuman strength, so I searched far and wide. In Bridgeport, Connecticut, on December 16th, 2019, Officer Carlos Carmo Jr. was working traffic duty near a high school. It had just let out. Students flooded the sidewalks, making their way home. And Officer Carmo noticed something strange about an SUV that rolled right by him. It had no driver. Oh, boy. But there was one elderly person in the passenger seat and another elderly person in the rear seat. The SUV was rolling up behind several dozen students that were facing away from it. He tries screaming out to get the student's attention, but most of them were wearing headphones and couldn't hear him. So what did Officer Carmo do? Goes running towards the car. The person in the passenger seat open their door and it was enough for him to actually grab onto it. He then plants his feet and no. brought the several thousand pound SUV to a halt using nothing more than his body. See, this is it. This, <laughs> this is the one. This is what I was looking for. There's footage of it. No. Yes. This dude goes running down the street. You see the door just slightly pop open. It's enough for him to get his hands around. He's holding on to like the uh, the window, like the window stem. Mm -hmm. And he just plants his feet, man. And it's dragging him. And he's just staying there. And it's veering closer and closer to where the kids are. And it just comes up right next to a tree and just comes right to a perfect stop. He suffered some minor scrapes, but he was checked out at the hospital, quickly released. They learned that the SUV had somehow slipped into gear after the driver exited the vehicle. 
In early 2020, uh, Officer Carmel was honored by the mayor and his police chief for his heroic efforts. Quote, I don't think I did anything spectacular or special, he said. I work at a great department with great officers, and any one of them would be able to stop that car. Oh my gosh, that just made me so happy. <laughs> How on earth did he manage to do that? I don't, I, I can't even explain it, just watching it. It's just... It looks like something you'd see in a superhero movie. Like someone yeah. grabs it, like Spider-Man would run up and grab it and like just plant his feet. And, you know, you go skidding along for a little mm -hmm. bit, but you're slowing it down as you're skidding. That's exactly what happens. Well, I know that there's like a huge science to it about like when your body releases a ton of adrenaline in moments yeah. like that, like way yeah. more than you need. And there's a name for it. And I cannot remember what it is, but I was looking into that thinking I could get like good search terms to find something. Yeah. And I mean, it's a real thing that happens where your adrenaline just goes to the point where you can do things you would not normally be able to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. but I was looking so hard for one and that was perfect. Yeah. Oh man, and it makes me so nervous because I'm always on my headphones and that's what that's one of the things he uh, was kind of pointing out. He's like, oh, he's like, I was really take them out. Yeah. Yeah. I really it. wish they all weren't wearing their headphones, but they were. So the only thing I could do, run over and stop the car. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know, dragged the car. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. And the guy, I mean, you you can tell the guy's in shape, but uh still, I mean, it's it's amazing. It's amazing to see. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow, some good stories there. Mm hmm But the real question, who is gonna win this month? I don't know. The I audience, don't know. you guys get to vote. Yep. Who told the best real life superhero story? I think they were both so awesome. I feel like we've both just done such a great job the past two months. Not yeah. to toot both of our horns, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Those were some good stories. I think so too. I think I'm very proud of today's episode. It's going to be tight like, again. It is, hopefully. <laughs> if you'd like to vote, <laughs> go to Twitter and follow us at Crime After Pod, where you can vote for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We always have a link in the description box below, and you can still click the little letter I at the top of the screen if you're watching the YouTube version, and that will link you directly there. While you're at Crime After Crime Podcast, check out all the other stuff we've got there, including where you can find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly and not to, you know, give anything away, but for the first time in our the entirety of doing these. John's questions left me speechless on the latest episode. So I'm just saying I suggest it for the first time. I didn't have anything to say. This is like a monumental moment. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Yeah. If you jump on Patreon in time to see this month, you might also see what John thinks of Jammy Dodgers. <laughs> taste test. Dun, dun, mm. dun. <laughs> And if you don't, that's okay. We'll be back on August 1st with another episode. And the topic for that one, wedding crimes, Danielle. Ooh, this could go so many ways. I'm already wedding. thinking of so many terrible ways. And I'm like feeling bad for people that I don't even know yet. Because I know it's bound to have happened to someone. <laughs> wedding crimes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. This show is produced and hosted by... Myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone, hey, that last episode of Crime After Crime, that was amazing. You guys need to check it out. Thank you, guys. And we will see you next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye. <laughs>